Well, good morning, church. My name is Marcelo, one of the pastors. It's so good to see you. Well, I can't see you, but you know what I mean. It's so good to be here with you. Let me pray as we dig into God's Word together. Heavenly Father, open our eyes that we may see wonderful things in your Word. Amen. Well, an, an 18th century preacher named Jonathan Edwards once said this, God created man for nothing else but happiness. He created him only that he might communicate happiness to him. Bit provocative, that statement, isn't it? What do you mean, nothing else? What do you mean, only? It nearly sounds like the mantra of our hedonistic society where right and wrong are determined by what brings me the maximum amount of pleasure. Consumerism, gluttony, excess. Well, as we unpack Psalm 1 today, it really helps us understand these words and it answers the question, how do I find happiness? Now, this term, uh, as Grant said, we're spending the whole term in the book of Psalms. I'm really looking forward to this. It's, it's a book that's actually, I don't know if you knew this, but it's the most quoted book in the New Testament, and it's the most quoted book by Jesus. One pastor says this about the Psalms. People look at mirrors to see what they look like. They look at the Psalms to find out who they are. You see, the Psalms show us the shape of our souls. It also shows us the curve of our sin, the realities hidden deep within us that we need to bring to light, focus on, and name. You ready to look at the Psalms together this term? Well, we're starting at the very beginning, a very good place to start, Psalm 1, and it begins with what makes a person blessed. Look at down verse 1. Verse 1 says, Blessed is the one who. Blessed is the one who. Happy is the one who. Now, from the outset, we really need to make sure we understand what this word blessed means, what this happy word means. It's actually in the plural. And so, really, it should say something like blessednesses or happinesses. It's, it's a bit strange, but it's, we're not talking worldly, short-term, short-gain, fleeting, sugar-hit happiness. We're not talking physical comfort, six-figure salaries, white sand, beach holidays, Big Macs after big nights, cuddling puppies. We're not talking short-term pleasure. The word used here, it's much weightier than that. It's used throughout the Psalms and it describes a happiness of the soul. It's a word that describes spiritual joy, a peaceful heart, a satisfied soul. It's this unshakable joy when life is not going right. In the face of adversity, when God's favor seems to not even be upon you, there's this what people call a holy happiness. Do you want that? Is that what you would like for your life, this lifelong happiness? And if so, how do we get it? Well, the psalm answers that question, how do we get this lifelong happiness, in two ways. Firstly, negative and then positively. So the first point for us today is happiness is found in saying no to the world's influence. There is joy and happiness to be found in us saying no to something. Look at verse 1 again. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. Now, I love the poetry here. Have you noticed the three-step progression? This descending tragedy from walking with to standing with to sitting down amongst those who are wicked sinners and mockers, those who silence God or oppose Him outright. What we have is this, it's describing an increasing familiarity and comfortableness. One minute you're walking once you start once you're walking you all of a sudden you stop and you look around and you think this is nice and then you sit down 
you enjoy the company of those you are with. In this descending tragedy, we move from casual interest to serious consideration to deep formed convictions. Now, the point is really, really simple. Be extremely careful about the company that you keep or the counsel you believe. You see, who you listen to, the lies you let yourself believe, all affect your happiness, your blessednesses. So let me ask you a couple of questions. Who are you allowing to influence your life? Who are you opening yourself up to? Who has your ear? You see, the world around us is constantly fighting for our attention. More than that, our world is fighting for your allegiance. Who is setting the agenda of your life? Is it a singer? Is it a blogger, a celebrity? Is it an influencer on Instagram? Is it a podcast, a guru? Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's a family member. Now, we all know, don't we, that we become like the people you hang around with. It's why when I was in high school, I did so many stupid things. Not just in my hairstyle or the way I wore my pants. But I remember that my mum would always ask me, every time, only if she caught me, mind you, she would always ask me, Marcelo, why did you do that? And I would always often reply, whether it was in primary school or high school or, you know, even later in life, my reply would be, because so-and-so told me to. And my mum, she always had the same response, and I learned to hate it. She would always say, if so-and-so told you to jump off a bridge, would you do it? And my response as a defiant teenager was always, yeah. How foolish was I? How much heartache, how much sin could have been prevented if I had not let the wrong people influence me could the reason that you are unhappy and i'm talking not worldly unhappy but spiritually soul unhappy restless could the reason be because of who you are allowing to influence you and the way you live now don't mishear me Please don't miss me. I'm not saying do not spend any time with non-Christians and don't have non-Christian friends. That's, that's not what I'm saying. How are they going to hear the gospel otherwise? But what I am saying and what it means is that we need to be so discerning about the company we keep, the advice we follow, the habits we develop and where we get them from. It does mean that there is a real and there is a, a subtle Subtle danger about forming too close a relationship with a non-believer. Now, please hear the warning, but please be present in the life of those who do not yet know Jesus. What did Jesus say to us? You are the light of the world. It's coming up on the screen. A town cannot be a town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Please, please, please have friendships, relationships with those who are not yet believers. But always ask yourself, who is influencing whom? Because there's always going to be someone influencing the other. It's either you influencing them, pulling them towards Christ, showing them that there is this incredible message of hope, or they will be pulling you, pulling you towards their lifestyle away from Christ. Happiness is found by saying no to worldly influences. 
But saying no is just half the answer. Point two, happiness is found in saying yes to God's word. You see, the way to happiness is not just me avoidance and denial saying no, no, no. That'll get you so far, but that's, that in itself is not enough. And the psalmist knows that the road to happiness is actually saying no, but also saying yes. It's attraction, it's rejoicing, it's allurement. Look at verse 2. Blessed is the one whose delight is in the law of the Lord, who meditates on his law day and night. You see, what allows us to see sinners and scoffers for who they are and what they are, to see the folly of that lifestyle, of their counsel. It's the word of God. See, the the law of the Lord in this verse, it's actually God's word in written form. The Bible, it's, it's this book here, the way God has chosen to reveal himself to us. And so this psalm is saying that the blessed person, the, the happy one, delights in God's word. They, they meditate day and night. His or her delight, their joy, their happiness comes from the Word of God. For this person in this psalm, it's not a chore, it's not a duty, it's it's not done out of guilt. And so my question is, do you believe that? Do you believe that somehow your happiness, your quality of life, of your soul is is somehow linked to how enthralled you are by this book? Or do you go looking for happiness elsewhere? So how do we do it? How do we how do we delight in God's word? How do we what does it actually look like? Well, firstly, I think it actually begins when we realize what exactly it is that we hold in our hands. You see, God is not only good to us, God is good for us. You see, uh, let, let me explain it this way. God's ways, His instructions, His commands, His, His way of life is actually for our good It's for your flourishing. He made you. He knows you. He put together the universe. And of course, he knows how it works. Of course, he knows the best outcome, the best way to live under him. Jesus came to give us life to the full. He didn't come to rob us of any joy. But my way, our ways, without God, they they aren't for our good, maybe fleetingly. But our ways lead to death. Friends, God has so much to say to you and he wants to say it in his written word. It was given once long ago, but it keeps on speaking now. It is active. It is living. It is sharper than a two-edged sword. The problem for you and I is that we're not very good at listening, are we? I think secondly, to delight in God's word means we must meditate on it. We must meditate on it. And to meditate simply means to fill one's mind with God's word. It means to reflect on it, to think on it, to mull it over and over again, again, to memorize it. It's not just reading and understanding. That's why I loved the interview we had. And you hear Diana saying that, She listens to the word and then she writes it down. She writes down what speaks. That's meditating. That was such a beautiful example. Thank you, sister. Well, you're in my lounge room, so thank you. And so the call to meditate day and night is a call for us to have the word of God on our minds, on our hearts, on our lips continuously. Now, before you say, Marcelo, that's impossible. What are you talking? I'm not a, I'm not a monk. I'm not, I'm not in ministry like you. We all meditate on something. We all have that thing, that person, that pursuit that occupies our minds, our hearts, and our lips 24-7. What is it for you? You see, the object of our meditation shows us what's in our heart. 
It shows us what we, what we um, treasure and value. And so if we are to truly delight in God's word, to find deep, satisfying happiness, we must meditate on his word. God's word will transform you, but friends, we need to let it. You need to give it the attention necessary to do that transforming work in your life. You see, complaining that God is silent when your Bible is closed is like complaining about not getting any text on your phone when it's switched off. Now, let's be real. I find this hard. My, my history as a, as a believer, I've struggled in this area. I've had ups and downs. I've had wins. I've had losses. Just recently when we had the lockdown a few weeks, months ago, whenever it was, there was two weeks where I did not meditate on God's word at all other than come along to church. I know as I look back on my life, when I'm meditating on God's word regularly, on my, in my quiet times with believers at church, I know that my focus on worldly things diminishes and those voices influ- influencing me to live apart from God diminish. But the opposite is also true. When I find myself in a spiritual rut or like God is distant or like I'm, I'm, I'm harboring a sin that I shouldn't, I eventually, and often way too late, ask myself, am I meditating on God's word? And I can guarantee you that the answer is nine, out of t- nine times out of ten, no. And so what would it look like for you to begin to meditate on God's word? To take just one step in that direction? What's one thing you could do? Maybe it means finding ten minutes every couple of days to read the word for five minutes and then spend the next five minutes turning what you've read into a prayer. Maybe it is joining a growth group. Again, Stefan, thanks for my illustration. Stefan's a wonderful example of how you meditate on God's Word in a group at our church. Maybe you have a friend at church that you can ask and say to them, Hey, bro, hey, sis. I know you don't actually talk like that. Maybe you do. Do you want to catch up and read the Bible with me? Once a week. Once every two weeks. When you catch up with someone from church, maybe just ask them, hey, how has God been teaching you, growing you as you've meditated on his word recently? Wouldn't it be tragic if Christians, God's people, his followers spent time together and talked about everything but God himself? Pray. Ask God to give you new spiritual taste buds that you might develop a hungering and an appetite for his sweet and tasty word. There's so much you can do. There's so much you can do. But my advice is this. Do little often. Do little often. Start small, build a habit. Don't say, okay, I'm going to read 10 Scriptures, 10 chapters of, of the Bible today, tomorrow, and then by the end of the week, you would have put it down and you'll never come back. Do little often, build the habit, do it in a community. What's the result of someone who meditates like this? Have a look at verse 3. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do, they prosper. See, the wise and happy person, delighting in God's word, meditating on it, grows to be this incredible, flourishing tree, deep roots, healthy. Its leaves do not wither. It's it's not just a tree that survives, but it's a tree that thrives. Now, have you ever planted a tree or have you ever seen a tree be planted and then you come back the next day? What do you see? Not much has changed, has it? Chances are nothing has changed. You see the exact same thing. But over time, as that little seedling is watered, nurtured, fed, it might not be visible to the eye day by day, but you come back a year later, it's grown. You come back five years later, it's huge. You come back 20 years later, and this tree is producing shade and fruit, and it's incredible. 
There's a quote from a lady called Jen Wilkin, and she says this. I love it. We will not wake up 10 years from now and have accidentally taken on the character of God. Friends, you, you don't fall into godliness and wake up and it doesn't happen that way. It's an investment, day by day, putting in a little bit into that spiritual bank. Growth comes slowly, but over time. So you, you wouldn't quit the gym after the week if you didn't see results at the end of that week. Well, look, maybe you would, and that's a bad example. I don't know. But like, how much more for God's Word? How often do we read the Word for a week, two weeks? Maybe you do a month, maybe whatever it is, and then you give up because things haven't changed. Trees don't grow in a day. Well, the happy person says no to the influence of the world and instead says yes to God's word, filling their minds and their lives with it. Well, point three, as we finish up, two ways to live. Did you notice that as Sam read this psalm that there are two paths? There are two groups of people that the whole of humanity can be divided into. There's no middle ground, there's no grey area, there's no third option for us. The Bible and this psalm is so clear, we're all on one of two paths. Either you take heed the counsel of the wicked and sinners, walking in their ways, sitting with them, standing, and such a person is like, verse 4, it's on the screen, they are like chaff that the wind blows away. Verse 5, these people, the wicked, will therefore not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads where? To destruction. That's one path. Or you're on the path of righteousness. The one who delights in God's word, meditating on it, building their life upon it. Verse 3, they're that tree that flourishes. And verse 6, the Lord watches over the way of the righteous. This is the person who is blessed, truly happy, two paths. Now, if I'm honest with you, this description of the happy person, the blessed person in this psalm, does not describe me. And I don't think it describes you either. Now, before you kill me, wait. Wait. Why do I say that? Because the second that you or I find our delight in something other than God and His revealed Word, we actually show that we think blessing is to be found walking some other path. So how do we get onto that path of righteousness? How, how does that blessedness, those happinesses become ours? Now, the answer is not read your Bible and then you'll be saved. The answer isn't I must stir myself up to try to be more like that blessed, happy person and less like those wicked people. That's not the answer at all, friends. Look closely at verse 1. Blessed is the one. Literally, blessed is the man. Did you notice it's in the singular? There is only one person who truly fits the description of this psalm here. One man who has ever spoken Psalm 1 out, fully believed it, and lived it out. You know where I'm going with this. Jesus Christ, God's Son, come from heaven to earth. These are His words before they are our words. And so the only way wicked, sinful people like me can ever get onto that path of righteousness is because of God's sovereign, saving, merciful grace in Jesus Christ. Psalm 2, the very next psalm, and they, they, they kind of come as a package. It finishes the exact same way Psalm 1 starts. Psalm 2.12 says this, Blessed, happy satisfied are all who take refuge in him, in Jesus. And so if you put your trust and your faith in him today, that happiness, that blessedness is yours. 
You see, Psalm 1 isn't telling us to become something that we are not, but to increasingly become something that Jesus already is. Will you today, perhaps for the very first time, walk away from sin, walk away from the counsel of the wicked, those worldly influences in your life, and walk towards His Son, the Word of God, Jesus Himself. Now I want to finish with this quote that I read this week that's just been stirring my heart. It says this, Our sin is not that we long to be happy, but that we are stupidly and blindly determined to find it in something or someone other than God and all that He is for us in Jesus. Friends, God is good to us and He is good for us. Let's stop chasing after sugar hit highs that end like that. But instead, let's find true, lasting soul happiness in His beautiful Son met in His Word. He has created you for nothing else but this kind of happiness. Shall we pray? Lord Jesus, thank you for coming to give us life and life to the full. You are an incredibly kind and merciful God to us, even when we've lived our lives spitting in your face. Forgive us. Thank you for giving us your righteousness and the ability to have a truly blessed and happy life. And I pray that anyone listening right now who has been wandering away from you, who hasn't delighted in you or your word, who is listening to the counsel of the wicked, would right now repent of that, turn away from that, and put their trust in you and you alone. We love you, Lord Jesus. And it's in your beautiful, precious, mighty, powerful name we pray. Amen.